My name is Nathan Sorensen. Uh, I work at uh, Spark Fund. Uh, we do energy efficiency financing, and I'm going to be talking about domain specific type systems. Um, so, this talk's going to have two parts. Uh, on one hand, I'm going to be talking about writing type systems for domain specific languages, and I'm going to talk about a DSL we wrote at Spark Fund uh, that we found really useful. So, I'm going to just go through uh, how that worked for us and what that can look like in your case. Um, but I also want to step back and talk more generally. Um, so if you don't find yourself writing kind of like a classic DSL, I want to argue that a lot of what we do as programmers is create domain-specific abstractions. And a lot of the design work we do uh, can be done really well, and types are a really effective tool for talking about these domain-specific designs. Uh, so I want to, I want to uh, approach the topic from, from the high level and, and something concrete. Um, and I also want to be quite generous in what I mean by domain specific. Uh, so we all have uh, examples of kind of brand name domain specific languages like SQL or Make, which are these external tools we use to do a specific job. We also know we can have embedded DSLs, so uh, macros in Clojure let us uh, do list comprehensions or, or have namespace forms that give us uh, convenient syntax for doing something inside of a language. But I also think when you're working with a library, you're also getting to manipulate abstractions that are specific to a particular domain. So for example, uh, a routing library like Pedestal or NLive, which lets you do HTML selectors. Even though there's not necessarily macros involved, you still have a very opinionated set of abstractions that represent a domain and help you understand how to, how to work with a domain and, and how to engage with it. So I want to kind of include all of this type of design uh, in this talk, and I think doing a good job at any of these involves the same kind of, solving the same kind of problems. And this is, this is uh, what the job of programming is, as described in uh, the book, How to Design Programs. And I'm gonna be citing this book a lot. Um, it's an undergraduate textbook that teaches uh, undergraduates not just how to program, but how to be programmers, um, how to, how to do our job in the middle space between working in a domain, representing concepts in this domain as programs, but interpreting that back into these particular domains. Um, so we don't just tinker with programs so they give results. We need to interpret those results to teach us more about our jobs or understand what our correct decisions or actually influence the real world by sending emails and things like that. So to talk about how types fit into this model, I'm gonna be working through uh, what I mean by a type system. And, and this is gonna be as described by uh, John Reynolds in his paper, Types, Abstraction, and Polymorphism. And this is a, a really classic paper in type theory. Um, and, and the whole paper is about how types are a way we, we write these abstractions. And in the paper, uh, he says, type structure is a syntactic discipline for enforcing levels of abstraction. Now this is kind of like a dense quote, uh, so, so let's just work bottom up um, and going through what, what each of these words mean. So let's start with abstraction. So just take a second to think, you know, we use this word all the time, but, but what would be a pithy definition for, like what do we mean as programmers by the word abstraction? I think one sense that we often mean is to kind of summarize something complicated. So that's the idea to, to make like an abridged version. And this is literally like the abstract of a paper. It's, it's hiding details and giving you the high level summary. And we know a lot of abstractions that have that sense of hiding messy details or just giving you the, what you need to know to, to get the high level picture. I think a lot of times we also think of the idea of isolating commonalities between different things. So at Spark Fund, we'll have uh, maybe leases for, for LED lights with a lot of different companies. Uh, and there's a lot of repetition in the structure of these leases, so then we can have a lambda abstraction to show what's common between all the leases and what varies, and the part that varies is a variable. Now, both of these definitions uh, kind of tackle the definition from the idea of compression. So, so definition one has this idea of a lossy compression where we're, we're losing some of the details but kind of getting the gist of it. And the idea of lambda abstraction doesn't really lose information, but it's the idea of like factoring it out in a more efficient way. Um, the problem with thinking of abstraction as compression is you know, what's stopping us from just throwing our documents 
uh, through a JPEG compression and uh, gzipping them. Right? The point is that these aren't bad abstractions or non-composable abstractions. It's just these, this is not abstraction at all. The, the point isn't compression, even though that's often involved uh, in the process of abstraction. The point of abstraction is to uh, create a map for a domain. So this is like an actual tangible artifact we give to a human to understand the domain they're in. So like literally a map you would give to a pedestrian to help them understand how to get from point A to point B. And this is something that is more why we make abstractions, because the audience becomes important. We'd give a different map to a pedestrian than we would to a city planner. But the idea is the map always it helps human understanding and it helps human creativity in reimagining the situation. So you can do hypothetical reasoning. So as a pedestrian, I can think, if I want to get to point B by 3 o'clock, I'll have to leave 15 minutes early. And if you're a city planner, you can think, well, if I rearrange the street and add a bike lane here, that might help traffic. So it, it, it's this level of abstracting over domain that's the important part of abstraction. Abstractions are also specification. Uh, Jean-Yves Girard is a logician uh, who did a lot of important work on type theory, and he says abstractions are specifications in the way that tires are abstractions. And he says tires become abstractions because they've got numbers describing when we can swap one out for another, and we know what size they are so they fit on our rims and so on. He also talks about money being an abstraction. So in our society, we have ways of assigning debt to each other, and it's like a protocol that a lot of things can implement, like cash and bank accounts and credit cards and so on. And the interesting thing is that both of these are kind of two sides of the same process, depending on which way causality flows. So when we think of maps, we think of the landscape as sort of existing, and all we can do is describe what we see. This is how abstractions work in the natural sciences. So gravity works a certain way, and so we come up with the abstraction of Newton's laws of gravitation to understand this and sort of creatively imagine how to shoot rockets into space. But a lot of times, as programmers, we're in the other situation where nature adapts to fit to our abstractions. So if I'm writing a public API, the real world code starts cropping up that that's using my code, and then you know, I come up with a tire specification and real tires start getting built that match my, my abstractions. And, and quite often, reality is somewhere in the middle where there's a bit of back and forth, where we describe what's happening, but we're also specifying what ought to happen. So, so this, is, this, is, this is the idea of abstracting over a domain. And types are somehow about levels of, of, of excuse me, abstraction. And I think this is something that we're really familiar with as programmers. You know, when we write closure, we know there's a long uh, path before we see anything uh, running on a microprocessor. And, and, and we see this pattern any dimension or axis we look. So whether that's fetching web pages or saving files to a disk. And I think this is why I've never met a programmer who was confused by the movie Inception. <laughs> right? I mean, like, worlds within worlds, like, I did this before breakfast today. <laughs> like, showing, showing programmers Inception is like showing Jaws to an actual shark. Like, <laughs> they're not going to be impressed. So, so, so the point of how, how types relate to these layers of abstraction is described in the paper through a, pa a fable. And I, I tell it a little bit differently than it is in the paper, uh, but the story is that there's, uh, there's a couple, and they're both mathematicians, and they give birth to twins. Uh, and they soon realize that they have irreconcilable differences on how to raise their kids uh, on the subject of complex analysis. Uh, so they, they amicably decide to part ways and, and separate the twins at birth, and they, they each take one. The mother travels to, to England, and you know, teaches her kid that a complex number is formed by a pair of real numbers. Uh, one represents the real component, and one represents the imaginary component. And then it taught her how to add them and multiply them and exponentiate them, and then derived a bunch of results on top of this abstraction. Meanwhile, the father moved to California and taught her daughter that, uh, that real numbers uh, consist of two real numbers, or sorry, a complex number consists of two real numbers. One represents the distance from the origin, and one represents the angle from the real axis. And then he taught her how to add them, and multiply them, and exponentiate them, and then drive a bunch of subsequent results. 
Now, as fate would have it, uh, the two twins uh, discovered each other at summer camp and hatched a plan to swap places uh, unknown to their parents. <laughs> and the ruse went on for several weeks until their parents realized with horror what had happened. Uh, the wrong twin had been receiving the wrong math curricula. Um, but then something incredible happened, and you wouldn't guess what. They both got 100% on their final exams. How did this happen? Well, it turns out both parents had an intuitive notion of type, which allowed them to talk at a level of abstraction that was completely compatible in the later courses. Uh, this led them to reconcile their differences and get back together, and everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> Um, so so the, the whole paper is about making precise this notion of an intuitive understanding of type and, and really formalizing this with, with kind of heavy-duty math. Um, and, and it gets a little bit dense, so I usually recommend just watching the Disney adaptation, <laughs> which is wholesome family fun. Uh, but but what, are, what are the lessons that we can draw just from this, from this parable? And one is that types aren't data structures. Um, if we said complex numbers were equivalent to pairs of real numbers, the twins would have got confused and started giving wrong answers. They're not the same, but there is this bijection between them. They're really two, they're, you're talking at two different levels, and you're able to intuitively know when you're switching register and talking about either one. And this goes back to how to design programs and our idea of domain-specific abstractions. We have a representation in our programs of complex numbers, and we can interpret our representations as complex numbers, but we're always negotiating the distinction between them, and that's kind of where our expertise, expertise lies as programmers. And types help us, in a, help us talk about this distinction in an interesting way, and that's at the level of syntax. Now, uh, when we're talking about syntax here, you know, we don't want to think about tabs versus spaces. Or, or, or even structured data versus strings of characters. Um, all of that can be syntax. The idea is that it's just a static description of a program, right? So it's, it's like what we check into source control. Now, every, every programming language has a static semantics and a dynamic semantics. The static semantics are talking about how do we combine our descriptions together? How do we understand what a description means and how do, how, what's a valid description? And the dynamics are, what happens when we plug our programs into the electrical socket and press go, and you know, what, what do they do when they're running? And you can make knowledge claims about either of these perspectives, and they're both important. Uh, when we talk about the dynamics, this is where we're using unit tests and generative tests to make claims. Um, and, and the interesting thing is all of the claims from this perspective take the form of falsifiable conjectures. So when you write a unit test or when you write a generative test, you're not really saying why you believe something's true. You're giving a mechanism to build confidence that it's true. And this is the same idea of Karl Popper's idea of, of, of scientific knowledge. Um, you should listen to what I'm saying because I'm giving you a technique to use to prove that I'm a liar. So that's why you can trust my confidence. And that's how, that's how generative tests work. Um, you, you say, you know, shovel all these numbers into my running machine and they should all have this property. If they don't, you'll find out, and you can, you can say I'm lying. And types are coming from the opposite perspective when talking about a program. They're talking about the statics. So this is talking about the level of the syntax aside from however it runs. So that, and I think that's an important distinction that sometimes gets blurred when we talk about types. Um, so I just really want to emphasize thinking about this as properties about the syntax of the program. So imagine we have, we're setting up a function um, and don't think about this as a runtime function, just think about this as some text. And we have two, two things in our context, a sterling that has type string to int and x that has type string. So think of this as the actual characters of, as having this type. Um, and I think that helps just emphasize this perspective if you're not sort of used to thinking of it in this way. So, so sterling doesn't represent some variable that at runtime will have string to int. This piece of syntax has str type string to int. Now, in the real world, there's a really tight coupling between statics and, and dynamics, and they should always be in complete harmony. So you can kind of be back and forth and see them from both ways equally. But just for the purpose of this, this dichotomy, I think it's helpful to imagine it as just a property of syntax. And that lets us say things of like, when we put these two pieces of syntax together, this compound piece of syntax has type integer. Uh, 
right? And I'm not thinking about runtime. I'm not thinking about where in the program this piece of syntax lives. I'm not thinking if it's called on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, and, and that's just the, the angle that these types of knowledge claims are coming from. Um, and that can be important because we, we, we realize when we're reasoning syntactically, we can get upset when something dynamic sort of invades this mode of thought, right? Like if you, if you don't realize something's a dynamic variable, you suddenly do have to worry about where this function is called at runtime, and that can be surprising when that happens. And that's why, you know, usually you try to be very conservative about using dynamic scope and things like that. Um, and it's also nice to be able to make these claims because statics are, are our maps. Like, there, there are instruction manuals for how to use our software, and there are, like, our repair manuals for how to change our software when the requirements change. And there are these artifacts we give to humans, and incidentally, we also run them. And, and we know this, and we hear this all the time, but it's nice to have a rich language for talking about the, the, the text, or the map specifically. So, so, so as you're making claims about this perspective, uh, they have a different flavor, and that's of definition and derivation. Um, this is kind of like saying one plus one equals two, two because that's the definition of what one plus one means. Um, uh, this has type int because I'm following rule number two of your type theory. Um, so it's not really a claim that you have to test, it's just that's the definition of what a type is. So I'm spending a lot of time on this definition because I like how it defines types as not about enforcing correctness, but about describing abstractions. And I think a lot of us think about types as being something that improves correctness, and I think that's a lot what a lot of the advocacy for types is. It's like, you should use types because then your programs are more correct. And I'm not saying that's not the case, but it's like abstraction. It usually involves more correctness, but the purpose is to let us make more precise claims about the statics. Um, it's, it's, it's an artifact for humans to consume, to reason about, and sort of creatively reimagine how to combine these programs together. So that lets us think about types as more of a design language. Simon Peyton Jones, uh, who's a creator of GHC, uh, one of the creators, uh, says types are the UML of functional programming. Uh, and he's talking specifically about Haskell, but I think it applies to all functional programming, um, even in untyped settings. So going again back to how to design programs, um, this is a curriculum based around an untyped language that's, that's related to Racket, and it's a, it's a scheme, and it's, it's untyped, but they give a design recipe for students to follow um, and to make sure you establish the habit of thinking through all these steps before you write code. So you start by describing your abstractions in terms of previous abstractions. Um, so this is introducing a new type. You talk about how to interpret that in your domain, and then you write a type signature for the function you want to write that you think would be useful. So this is checking for equality of complex numbers. And then you write a unit test to describe the dynamics of this function. And only then do you start writing the actual implementation. Now, I think, you know, as we get more experience, we short circuit a lot of these steps. But I think it's important just to remember that literally writing out the type has advantage in, in working through the design. And the point isn't that you know, it, you know, comments can get out of date and it should be a comment for it and formatted in a certain way, but types should be present in your mind when you're designing a function. And I think that's a valuable habit to, to, to make use of. So when you take this perspective, types also become a design criteria that help you make better designs. So imagine you're, you're, writing, you're writing an API for fetching prices from some market. And your team, team loves your, your work and is, is making good use of it. Uh, but they come back to you and say, you know, this is great, but we sometimes want to get a spread. So we want multiple prices back. And so you go back to the drawing board uh, and then think, you know, well, maybe we can just take an argument. And so if it's true, then you get what you got before. Whereas if it's false, then I'll give you, give you the spread. And then, you know, this works great and it meets the design requirements. Um, but then you start thinking, you know, I wonder, I wonder what type this has. So maybe you're trying to add some types to get more correctness later. And well, clearly it takes a Boolean and then returns what? Well, it kind of depends, right? It depends on the value of that Boolean. So we know if it's true, then we're returning a price. But if it's false, we're returning a list of prices. But what's this price ret thing that and we're saying the type is? Well, that, that's taking Booleans, clearly but then it's returning a type somehow. 
So this, you know, an innocent design process has led us to this dependent type family, which might take a PhD to describe to somebody. <laughs> and the point isn't using this as a jumping off point to talking about when dependent types are useful or not useful. It's just that it's clear that if you don't incorporate types into thinking through the design, you know, you probably would have reasonably given up at this point, just said, oh, it returns either one of the two, and, and kind of reasoned at that level. If you saw price x, where x is a variable, you just would have known it's one of the two, and you wouldn't have tried to say anything more. But if you start with the types in your mind, you would have maybe stepped back and say, hey, maybe we should split this into two functions. You know, one returns a price always, and one always returns a list of prices. Now this, in terms of static, you know, a claim of truth is just as strong as the dependent type, but it's way easier just to describe to someone and way easier to understand. When you see prices in syntax, you know how to rearrange that correctly. You know you can map over it. And this shouldn't be surprising. When you make things simpler, you often have more things. And I think this is something that I see in my own work a lot of times, is just split up into more multiple things. And I also think this perspective maybe adds a little bit to some of the classic you know, back and forth we have of when types are useful. So sometimes I imagine people saying that types are premature optimization. Um, and I think this argument actually does make sense if you think of types as adding correctness. Because it's important, you know, the, the hard part of our job is building the right thing. You know, we can always kind of try to make it more correct before we put it into production, and maybe that's where we want to add types. Um, so this is kind of the idea that types are like, they're like a Mod Podge glue you put over your puzzle when you're done and when you want to hang it up on the wall to show it off. It's something you kind of add after the fact. Um, but if types are part of the design process, this is like saying, I want to build the thing first and design it later. Like design is a premature optimization. And I think in the case of building abstractions and building public facing APIs, uh, you want to fight for as much design time as you can. And I think it's valuable because we know from experience it's always easier to build systems that turn out in a couple months to be actually surprisingly complex. And so I think, think types are a way of just reflecting that complexity from a different angle, the complexity of how tricky is the relationship of our, is our, of our syntax that we're sort of buying by making this design. So now I, I just want to talk about a DSL that we built at SparkFund that, is, that came out of a lot of these ideas and these philosophies. Uh, we have ton of, tons of Northeastern grads working with us, and they all grew up in the How to Design programs. Um, so it's a lot of fun working with this crew. Um, and, and the library is called Spectacular. Uh, and it, it gives our sort of dream type system that works on top of Datomic. Um, the original work comes from Jim Shargo, who was with us in the early days of SparkFund, um, but it's been really turned into something cool and useful uh, with the work of Claire Alvis. And uh, it's open source, but it's not, it's not really ready for public consumption yet. So you're not going to find any, any documentation here yet. It's just all source code comments. Um, but but if, if anything I say is interesting, you just want to check out how we did things, uh, the code's all in the open. So Datomic is really flexible in what it allows you to do. Um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. So if you imagine you have, you know, if you have people in your database and you have this concept of an attribute for a first name, you can now attach first names to anything in your database. So you could attach a first name to a corporation and, and things like that. Um, and likewise, if something points to another entity, there's nothing stopping you from pointing to anything in your database. So, so clearly no one does this in production. Um, we all kind of have conventions for what What's a sensible way for your entities to point to each other? And so we kind of congealed around this idea of specs to, art, excuse me, to articulate this. And at first, none of this was enforced. It was all a, a type system we agreed on in our minds for saying, wait, it doesn't make sense to attach a first name to a corporation. Here's the document that says what you can attach a first name to. So we have this idea of specs. Um, and here, here's a lease that can have a lessee. Uh, which is a corporation, and crucially, this can only point to corporations I can attach, um, attach like an email address to the lessee. Uh, these are also kind of namespaced, so, uh, you know, for example, there's a status field here. Other things can have status fields, and those status fields can have different types, so they're all kind of namespaced by the, by the type of spec that you're talking about. And we also have uh, enums, 
So here we can have status that can be unsigned or signed. Um, and this uh, turned into eventually more of a union type. So these branches or these, these variants that it can take of both themselves can have uh, fields and properties. But once we had all that written down, we started to be able to do cool things with it. So we could introspect our specifications. Even though they weren't enforced, we could print documentation and things like that. And one of the cool things that we started to do, and this is, this is Claire's work, uh, is write a query language that's aware of our types. So it lets us write shorthand. So I mentioned these are all namespaced. So if you were writing raw datomic, you'd have to say a lease slash lessee, and you'd have to know how that translation worked. We don't have to do that in our query language because it's aware of our, our conventions. So here you can see a query that's looking for all the leases and fetching the names of the lessees and binding that to the return. So it's basically giving us a, a, a list of strings back, which are the names. So I'm just going to walk through kind of how a type checking algorithm would tackle this. This is a really simple type system with no polymorphism and no high order functions. And instead of getting into the code, I'll just step through the algorithm just to give you a sense of, of what's going on. And this is something you probably probably drive for yourself if you, if you looked at it hard enough. And it also gives a good sense of how, uh, how type analysis is a very, is a very syntactic approach. So it's, it's totally directed by looking at the syntax as, as like symbols in source code. So uh, type checking starts at uh, the outermost expression, which is this query statement. And then we look at this and know that it's got to be some query that returns some type. We don't know what that is, but we are seeing that we're introducing a new variable n. So we'll just leave that in the type for now and come back to that later. And we're also introducing a scope. So we have a context to keep track of our outstanding variables. Um, and the variables that are, are in scope under, in this expression. So here in our context, we say we add a pair with the variable n and saying it as type E, and that stands for existential. So there exists some type that n is. We just don't know what it is yet. And then we proceed to the next sub-expression, which is this least statement. So here, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the pattern that's saying, find me all the leases in the database. And we know that the type of this should correspond with lease because it's written there. And there's no, no new variables being bound. So we just continue down to the next sub-expression, which is in the lessee field. And here we get to the name uh, pattern. So we're looking for the names of lessees. Now, just looking at this, we don't know, we no longer know what type this should be. So these are namespaced. So while lease uh, corporations have names, other things in the database could have name fields. So we don't know right now what type this should be. But we do know what our context is, and that is we're coming down from a lease. So we can expand the definition of lease, which is, has uh, these different fields, and follow the same path down that we followed in our expression. So that's where we know it's a corporation. And then we can continue, follow, expand the name field to the next sub-expression, and we hit a variable. Again, just looking at the variable, we don't know what type it should be, so we expand the definition of the parent type follow the field, and realize that it should be string. So now uh, we want to, s we're, 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 our type system's claiming that n probably should be string. So to double check that, we look n up in the context and see that it's still existential. So we, we still is some type that we don't know what it is. And that's compatible with saying it's a string, so we update our context to say n is equal to string. And that's our final obligation. So if you imagine this is a recursive uh, function that's going through the syntax, it will bubble back up uh, with, with our updated context, and we can update the query to say now it's a query of type string, just by fetching n out of the, out of the context there. And, and that's, that's really all there is to it. Um, this is, the, how I've showed this is, is called bidirectional type checking, just in terms of, of the different kind of nouns that describe this process. Uh, synthesis is when we look at an expression and know what type it ought to be. <laughs> Checking is when we know the type from some other context and we pass that down and compare them. Uh, when we're looking at a variable and have to compare that to a context and maybe update the context, that's called instantiation. And finally, substitution is when we're done and we know the context, we need to update the types to reflect the knowledge we've learned. Um, and this is, we don't actually use these terms in our type checker just because it's so simple and you can actually just write it all as one function. Um, but the nice thing about this is that if you do phrase in terms of these different, you know, if these are multi-methods, you can grow your type system 
and you can add more inference, and that would be in the synthesis, for example. So, so it's sort of like a framework for writing type checkers. And if, if you're interested in a more advanced example, uh, I'm, I'm sort of learning this myself, and you can see some of my, my stumbling around in this, this repo uh, where I'm applying these ideas to uh, polymorphism and higher order functions and things like that. And it's all based on a paper, and the references are, are in the project. Another nice thing about this approach is it makes it easy to give sensible error messages. Uh, when you are expanding the definitions, say, for example, you're using uh, a field name that doesn't exist, when you're going through the type checker, you always have the type at hand and the expression that you're looking at. So you can make an error message that says, Lease has no field, you know, your misspelled word. Um, and this can be as easy as just throwing an exception in your recursive function. Um, you, don't, you don't have to, to make this any fancier than that. Similarly, if you are doing an instantiation step and your usage doesn't match what you have in the context, for example, if we uh, try to bind n to a field that's a status instead of a string, you again have all the information you need there just to give a really sensible error message. But we'd also like to do more. So imagine this query is put into real source code. So this query would expand in some actual datomic query. It's a macro expansion. Um, and then if someone tries to map increment over it, so remember this is returning some query of strings, this is a type error. And it would be nice if we could alert someone that you, know, you can't actually do that. It's not unreasonable to expect that we catch this at compile time is because we know the type at compile time because all our specs are def uh, described. Um, and, and we can do that, you know, we don't have to write a type checker for all of closure because we have typed closure. So the trick here is uh, that we wrap our query, and this is all done by the macro queue, um, with this, 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 this other macro called ignore with unchecked cast, and this comes from typed closure. And this is basically saying, you know, trust me, type closure, I know this expression returns this type. So that way we can talk to typed closure and tell it what we know from our nice little simple type system and have typed closure, which is a really incredible piece of software that works on arbitrary closure code, which we would never be able to write ourselves, have it enforce that at, at the use site. So, so typed closure, if you type check your code, it will say, oh, you know, this expression is returning a query of, of string, uh, and you're trying to call increment on it. That doesn't make sense. Um, so this, this is an improvement on Datomic. Datomic takes sort of runtime data basically for its queries, and it has no way of saying at compile time what the queries return. So this is an improvement that just, uh, you know, it doesn't catch a lot of errors, but it's, it's, it gives us confidence in refactoring, and it just lets us know that our comments aren't gonna get out of date, right? The, the wins were part of the design. Enforcing it is just more convenient for us. Uh, and this is, uh, this, is, this, is the, this embedding into type closure is the idea of like an embedded DSL. Um, so we know that we can write DSLs that can be called by a host language. But here what we're doing is embedding the types of our DSL into the type system of the host language. And we do that just with a simple translation at macro expand. So that, that's like a quick high level just walkthrough of what it does. And I hope it just illustrates that if you have, if you have simple types as part of your design, odds are that there's a simple type checker you can write to, to enforce that. And it doesn't have to be a huge undertaking. Now, kind of the, the, the problem, you know, it's easy for me to get up here and talk about types. Uh, the problem is that, that type theory is just a huge subject, and I think it's just reasonable to, to admit that. Um, I didn't do any type theory in school, and I am a super beginner at all of this stuff, so this is my best understanding, and this is a reflection of what I've learned so far. Um, there's two classic textbooks, Types and Programming Languages, as well as Practical Foundations for Programming Languages. Uh, and I've been working through these books for, you know, it feels like years, um, and I'm always learning new things, but it is, it is like a big subject, and I think it's fair just to recognize that. Um, you know, we all have tons of things we feel like we should always be learning more about, and I guess all I can do is just give a little increment to the priority of type theory. I think it's really a fundamental part of programming. Um, I think it really is. You know, we have a lot of, of, of experience with these dynamic properties. We know how to write unit tests. We know how to write generative tests. But I think for me personally, I've, I never really thought about types as sort of the fundamental other perspective of our programs, the perspective of how do we make claims about our syntax. And our syntax is important. You know, it's what, you know, one of the most valuable things we produce as a physical artifact. Um, I also say it's 
I found it useful to study Haskell and OCaml. Um, and I, I studied Haskell specifically. Um, and, and this isn't like a language snobbery thing at all. It's just these, these languages have been around for 25 years. They've had a lot of time and a lot of good libraries sort of totally committed to this single idea of fancy types. And I think if you've got a finite amount of time to kind of fiddle with this stuff, I think I found it more, a better use of my time to learn it in a language where it was totally committed to these ideas and then port my knowledge back to type closure. Um, but that's just my, my experience. You know, you know I'm, you're spending less time learning about type theory and all the exceptions and compromises that have to be made because of the JVM or, or things like that. Um, so so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, here's just a, a link dump, mostly for the YouTube crowd. Um, stuff that either I mentioned or it was inspiring to me and kind of informed this talk. Um, but that's, that's all I've got. Um, uh, yeah, so takeaways are types aren't about correctness, but they're about a design language for abstraction. Abstraction's not about compression, but it's about artifacts we give to humans to help them understand a domain and creatively reimagine how to reconfigure that domain. And, you know, if you've got types as part of your design process, odds are you'll end up with simple types sometimes, and then, you know, feel free to write a type checker, because it's fun. Okay, so that's what I got. Cool. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Anybody has one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the question is like, you know, Spectacular is not ready for public consumption, but how are you using it today? So, so we are using it in production today, um, but we just haven't made it nice and we haven't made it easy for contributors to know how to grapple with our code base. So we're a very small team that know the code base intimately. Um, so we're using it in production now, um, but it's, we, don't feel it's, uh, we don't feel it's easy for other people to just uh, see and make use in their context necessarily. Um, but we do, we do find it useful, and we do find it a very... It, it's infected, it's actually infected our whole company, too. Um, our, our specs, we, we generate documentation for that, and our ops teams and our, um, you know, our product managers and, and sales people, when they're describing what we do, will refer to our documents. So, so really, the language that we use, and, and this goes back and forth, but we can really gather around our, our types and walk through the type file, and talk about like, well, it doesn't make sense for this to be called that and things like, so it's actually been a really good artifact for our whole company to, to kind of work through this together. Yeah. So the question is, can you design with too many types? And I think that's definitely true. Like if, if it's, a, it's a design language, so can you, can you write a map with too many symbols on it? Like definitely, right? It's, it's all about knowing your audience and it's all about knowing if you're giving a map to a pedestrian versus giving a map to a city planner. Um, if you're writing a theorem prover, you wanna give as many types as possible because they're experts and have studied this for a long time and have very subtle things they want to say. Um, but if you're, you're writing a simple calculator, you know, you maybe you don't need to go right into super advanced dependent type theory. I mean, that's not useful for helping people understand what they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what, what about prismatic schema? Um, prismatic schema is uh, a really good tool for the dynamics perspective, right? It lets you say really, in a really easy language, um, these are the things at runtime that I expect to happen, and it gives you good error messages when those aren't true. So like, you always want to say things from both states, and prismatic's a great way for talking about the dynamic enforcement of, of, of sort of true things. Yeah? Um, something about recursive types? Oh, spectacular. Um, it does, yeah. So, so you can have linked lists of things. Um, it, but other than that, it's basically nothing. So it actually doesn't have polymorphism. So like everything's a concrete type. And I think we can get away with that is because we've got, we just use the, the, uh, the cardinality of datomic. So we don't have lists and things like that. We just say it has one or it has is many. And that's datomics is one or is many. Um, odd, there's a chance we might have to upgrade to polymorphism. Um, but again, that's just, that's something we'll agree on as a team. Like 
we want to have this new concept that's higher order, and then we'll talk about how to do that. But for now, it's, it's recursive types and basically the simplest everything else. Cool. Well, thanks for your time. <laughs>